cats as familiar to them often as other humans are. So what makes a cat the animal it is? What gives it its grace and sinuousness? Its excellence as a hunter. It starts with the basic framework, a light and flexible but sturdy skeleton. The backbone, which includes the balancing tail, is the centerpiece of a cat's almost rubbery suppleness. The discs between the vertebrae are thicker than in many other animals, and the connections between the bones are looser, giving greater mobility. Like a ballet dancer on point, a cat walks on its toes. This effectively increases the length of the leg and the distance covered by each stride, giving the cat extra speed. It also means that, surprisingly, this joint is actually the cat's ankle, the beginning of the foot. The foot bones are greatly elongated. And it is only the toes that are in contact with the ground for extra push an extra bounce. Part of the secret of the cat's agility lies in the design of its shoulder. The collarbone is free-floating and the shoulder blades are not attached to the main skeleton. Everything is held together by ligaments and muscle, enabling the shoulder to move freely. And the muscles act a bit like springs, they're much more flexible than the muscles of most other mammals. They expand and contract like bungee cords and give the cat the power to jump several times its own height. A human with muscles like a cat's could leap from the ground to the top of a house. When a cat jumps, the power comes from the muscles of the hind legs. Each individual muscle is made up of many muscle fibers. These use a lot of energy to contract quickly, and when they let go, they let go like a catapult. Good for bursts of speed, but too exhausting for the long haul. A cat is a sprinter, not a marathon runner. The cat is also a tightrope walker. This is because its chest is so narrow and its front legs so close together. Whether it's on the branch of a tree or the top of a fence, it walks as if it's strolling down a street. But now that cats have come to live in houses, they don't always get to exercise their talents. There are ways, though, of turning interiors into surreal replicas of the outdoors. This is the world that belongs to Molly, little Jimmy, Bernard, Tom, Frank, and four leather cats. Like most people, you start off with a couple cats, and at that point we thought that two was the perfect family, and then one thing literally led to the next, and now we have nine, and nine cats seems perfectly normal for us. One thing we learned early on was that when we would go off to work every day is that we were leaving the cats in the house, and we realized that, hey, if possession was nine-tenths of the law, it was really their house. So we decided to make it user-friendly, in this case, cat-friendly. One thing we do know about cats is that they love to go up and over. Cats definitely love to get to high vantage points. They love to look down on us. And now we have about 140 feet of cat path that extends through almost every room in the house. So wherever we are, they are. You have a hard day today, Tom. Hey, Frank. Frank drops in on Bob's wife, Frances, while Tom receives her undivided attention, however brief. Whoa. In the age-old human-cat contract, humans get pleasure from their half of the bargain, and the cats enjoy an indoor world as interesting and stimulating as outdoors, only safer. 
We tried to make sure that our catwalk was not only friendly and fun for our cats, but also fun for us too. Another part of the cat's domestication bargain was that these essentially solitary animals had to learn to live with each other. At the Anthrozoology Institute in England, John Bradshaw has been studying how cats relate both to humans and to other cats. His laboratory is home to 11 cats who live in a tight-knit group. Cats are often portrayed as being rather selfish in contrast to the dog, which is a much more loyal animal. Cats, I don't think, have a concept of loyalty. They see their relationship with people as an equal partnership rather than as a subservient relationship. But, of course, they are also sociable. I think that we've sold cats short in this respect. They are very sociable towards people. They can be sociable towards other cats if they grow up in the right sort of environment. One famous study of free-ranging farm cats, made in 1977 by the Oxford biologist David MacDonald, showed just how sociable cats could be. Professor MacDonald's team fitted four cats with radio transmitters and followed them around for a year. Practically every move the cats made was recorded. There were three females and a male. The females, MacDonald found, always stayed around the farm in a close and friendly group. The male spent two-thirds of his time away, traveling, carousing, and mousing. But he always eventually did come home. The high point of the study was when the team witnessed one of the females helping another deliver her kittens. She acted as midwife and even helped bite the umbilical cord. Later, the two sharing a nest would nurse each other's kittens. It was the first scientific record of such close cooperation between semi-wild house cats and proof that, left to their own devices, they could be very sociable animals. What McDonald's work showed us was that cat society isn't arranged in a linear hierarchy in the way that uh, dog or wolf society is. It's much more of a, an equal partnership, a cooperation between related females that gather around a particular site where there's plenty of food and plenty of places to have kittens. Modern pest control techniques are driving working cats, the mousers in the barn, out of business. But there are still plenty of places in the world where semi-wild cats live together. On the Italian island of Stromboli, these cats are everywhere. Here, cats are hardly ever kept as personal pets, but there are kind people who look after and feed them. One of them in the village of Ginostra is Signora Ushi. She's been feeding an ever-changing colony for more than 40 years. Where you get groups of cats is where people provide quite large amounts of food. They may do that deliberately by actually feeding the cats. They may do it accidentally by leaving food outside restaurants or whatever. Once the cats realize that there is a regular supply of food there, then they'll aggregate around it and start forming a colony. And these colonies give us a wonderful way of studying cat behavior because it, can all, it all happens in a fairly small area and we can watch it. Otherwise, it, it's just too spread out and difficult to find. For cats, living socially means doing things that their wildcat ancestors never had to worry too much about. For instance, communicating constantly. A wildcat might use scent to mark territory, but these cats have refined scent marking into a language. By spraying urine and using special cheek glands, they leave messages as distinctive as a voice or signature. Smell is highly developed in cats. A cat's nose has a mucous membrane where smells are imprinted, twice the area of a human's. And just below it is a second smell detector, the Jacobson's organ. To use this, the cat draws air in through the mouth, and special cells analyze the scent. And smell isn't their only way of communicating. Cats also use rubbing. We think the rubbing signal is actually very important in cat society and also in cat-human society as well. Cats tend to rub on other cats that are slightly bigger or fiercer than they are. So, for example, females will tend to rub on a tomcat that they want to show some sort of deference towards. 
What they're doing when they rub on us is acknowledging that we are slightly stronger and more powerful than they are, uh, not necessarily superior, but, um, but just slightly larger, showing us some sort of deference so that they acknowledge that we're bigger, but they still want to be friendly. And then there's purring. Purring seems to be inviting some kind of attraction and also physical contact as well. So cats will purr when they're feeling contented and want another cat to come and sit down with them or, or their owner or whoever. Um, but they will also purr in situations when they're in great pain, such as perhaps when they've been hit by a car. It seems rather bizarre because of people thinking that purring is about pleasure. But it isn't really about pleasure. It's about attracting attention and trying to get help in that particular circumstance.